Observatory at the University of Arizona. She's um, got a leading role in DES and also in the forthcoming Rubin Observatory. And so Elizabeth's going to tell us about uh, large-scale structure cosmology in the systematics limited regime. So thanks very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I've already uh, learned a lot from the previous talks and I thought I would um, now provide um, a somewhat more practical perspective. That is, I want to talk about um, some of the current constraints that we get from um, photometric large-scale structure surveys using summary statistics. And uh, right now we are basically um, in a great training camp uh, for the uh, very large surveys coming up in the mid 2020s, Euclid, Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, Roman Space Telescope. That is right now, uh, we have uh, three um, collaborations in front of the competition, the Kilo Degree Survey, the Dark Energy Survey, and Hyper Supreme Cam, learning how to do cosmology analyses uh, from these uh, types of photometric surveys. Uh, where um, right now kids, the S and HSC, follow slightly different uh, service strategies. We all observe around 1,000 to 5,000 square degrees with slightly different depths, um, resulting in somewhat different pro um, parameter sensitivities, but close enough that we can really cross-check each other and learn from each other. So even though I uh, primarily um, mentioned the DS collaboration here, a lot of this is then also really uh, in cross-talk and uh, exchanges uh, with other collaborations. And that is right now we're um, trying to do this kind of analysis with of order 20 to 100 million galaxies uh, in order to then get ready uh, for tens of billion of galaxies coming to our hard drives in the mid 2020s. And um, if we start out now with a view of galaxies as idealized tracers, our observables in this large scale structure photometric surveys will be um, galaxy positions and shapes. And um, if someone gives us an expansion of positions and shapes um, perturbatively, uh, we will end up um, with expressions that uh, many of you have derived, and most of you have probably used if you haven't derived them. Um, uh, expanding galaxy density and galaxy shapes in terms of density, tidal field, and so on, uh, which then tells us about the scale dependence of the signals. But in uh, photometric surveys, uh, we um, observe projected statistics. So we really need the values of these coefficients along the line of sight. And uh, we need to understand that time dependence, which is where then already on large scales, a lot of astrophysics comes in. Because for example, our galaxies might be selected with an observational color cut, which then um, translates into rather different galaxy properties as a function of time. And that brings me to my preview of this talk. Uh, probably these types of analyses um, in circa 2025 will consist of about 5% parameters that we understand very well. Those are our cosmology parameters and then another 95% systematic parameters, uh, broadly speaking of known unknowns, such as uh, the time um, dependence of our bias parameters and such and unknown unknowns that uh, we will only learn about when we really analyze um, specific survey data. And um, especially in light of the previous talk, it's important uh, to point out here that most of these will be systematics that at least when we analyze um, summary statistics such as power spectra, that cannot be analytically marginalized. So they come with a lot of um, um, computational cost and other um, fun side effects. But um, let's start with a schematic uh, going from cosmology to observations. Let's say we start out with our 5% cosmology parameters. Those then describe our initial conditions, energy components, and uh, background evolution. Then we might put in a few more additional um, theory uncertainties to get to um, unobservables describing our 3D meta fluctuations, including, for example, nonlinear evolution as an example for those parameters, uh, at which point we then have the meta power spectrum, halo mass function, and uh, higher order statistics. Then in the next step, um, we go to our observables, which uh, for this talk will be uh, angular power spectra and um, cluster counts, but could also be other uh, projected tracer statistics or even fields. Um, at this point, um, a quite enormous number of parameter comes in. And then in the final and really complicated step, 
uh, we go from the observables um, as theorists might, or phenomenologists might calculate them to the actual observations, that is to maps, to trace our power spectra and cluster number counts as measured from the data. And I'll, I'll do the easy part today. I'll focus on astrophysical systematics, but you should have a look um, uh, at the early DES year three papers, and especially also Neil McCrann's talk tomorrow um, for some example of how complicated these observation systematics um, are in the current age. So let's put this all together. Now going from observations to cosmology, uh, where we will calculate our um, cosmology posterior given our observations. Uh, but, um, starting out with probably cosmology prior, because not every survey may fix everything. Uh, and then integrating out all our other parameters, which I'll call systematics now. Um, consisting of theory, astrophysics, and observational systematics. Of course, uh, these are all on equal footing. So if we are in inter interested in galaxy evolution, for example, rather than cosmology, we can simply switch what we integrate out. For these, we will equally need a prior that needs to be well mo motivated. And we need um, par uh, parameterizations for all of these effects. These then come in uh, in order to calculate the different um, steps for multi vector. First, we need uh, the theory of systematics to calculate meta power spectra and um, 3D halo mass functions. Then putting in astrophysics can go to angular power spectra and cluster number counts. And then finally, we also need to fold in the, the uh, observational systematics. And the important point here is that at each step, we need a consistent model of all these, uh, of these um, effects for all our observables. And uh, of course, we need to be able to um, motivate um, or at least defend the um, parameterizations in the end. This is then often also tied to the final ingredient here, our likelihood uh, for observables and systematics, uh, which uh, require data and systematics covariances and sometimes additional um, probability distributions uh, for these parameters. So each of these uh, are work of a large number of people. Um, and I'm sure many of us will be happy to chat um, with you about uh, specific ingredients uh, over coffee. Uh, I will just uh, give you some examples uh, today um, of recent work by some students and postdocs uh, pushing into the systematics limited regime. But briefly to set the stage, um, let's um, just um, be clear about what the different effects of systematics could be. In a systematics free survey, um, we get uh, bias free parameter estimates with um, just statistical uncertainty. If then somebody introduced um, a systematic that we don't know about, our analysis will be biased. Putting in a parameterization for that, and we can remove the um, parameter bias, uh, but increase the uncertainty from marginalizing out uh, the associated parameters. If we find this uh, increase in uncertainty to be large, we might go out um, to other surveys or to simulations uh, to get priors on these nuisance parameters uh, in order to recapture some of the information that had been lost. Uh, in practice, often we will end up in an intermediate regime where our residual parameter bias is not completely gone, um, but uh, our increased uncertainty is controlled. An important point here though is that this type of uh, validation then is always survey and analysis specific. If we've shown that uh, the bias is under control for say the weak lensing analysis in one survey, we can't um, simply say, okay, this will be now good enough for all other an analyses in this survey. Because all these statements here about, uh, about bias relative to the uncertainty of that specific analysis. So that said, um, when we're doing uh, precision cosmology, meaning we're systematics limited, uh, we are largely person power limited in terms of coming up um, with parameterizations and figuring out how to navigate these complicated parameter spaces. Coming up with possible systematics is the easiest part. Uh, for example, we did a survey of the DAC energy survey calibration uh, in 2013 before we started analyzing data. Uh, what systematics and nuisance parameters are people expected. Uh, the um, systematics that were named wouldn't surprise anyone, uh, but we ended up with a list of 500 to 1,000 parameters. Well, yeah, uh, 
for um, current uh, data that is rather infeasible, at least if we actually have to uh, explicitly marginalize all of them and given our constraining power. So uh, much of um, the work then is uh, to prioritize and figure out what's really needed. An additional complication here is that um, poorly constrained systematics, which are correlated with the parameters of interest, can lead to um, ugly projection effects. So here we have an idealized analysis where the input data or theory um, exactly matches the uh, analysis model. And um, then, of course, we get uh, the maximum uh, likelihood exactly at the input cosmology. However, the marginalized materials uh, are shifted, as you can see uh, in these contours, it's not really being centered uh, on the cross. And uh, this is now an analysis in about 35 um, dimensions, uh, where some of our systematics parameters, in particular, the redshift evolution of intrinsic alignments, um, are poorly constrained and effectively um, correlated with the um, cosmology systematics. So introducing too many systematics just to be on the safe side um, will result in analysis that are very hard to interpret. Uh, and we have to find a balance there. So as my basic work example, let me briefly explain to you um, what we did in the baseline DS year one analysis. That's about 1,300 square degrees uh, from the DS footprint, uh, where we analyzed uh, about 600,000 uh, red magic galaxies uh, so red, red sequence galaxies with excellent uh, photoses split into five redshift bins for galaxy clustering and 20 million, 26 million source galaxies split into four redshift bins which we then use for um, shape shape correlations that's cosmic shear and in cross correlation for galaxy galaxy lensing. Uh, I'm sure people here have seen these uh, constraints before. Um, let's just say that um, after figuring out all the systematics and marginalizing over four additional cosmology um, parameters, 10 clustering Newton parameters and 10 lensing Newton parameters, uh, we obtain beautiful constraints on omega meta and S8, uh, where the results from cosmic shear and galaxy clustering, galaxy galaxy lensing. So our two data splits are consistent and we are allowed to combine them in these blue constraints uh, where the central values differ by more than one sigma from Planck and fall on the same direction as other weak lensing surveys. So um, we definitely need more galaxies to figure out um, uh, whether this is a fluke or an actual tension emerging. But now let's talk about uh, what's not shown in the plot. That is the systematics that we marginalized over. And you'll notice now that from 500 parameters, we went down to 20. That is, uh, we work with one linear bias parameter per uh, lens galaxy bin. And then uh, simple shift parameters for each uh, lens and source um, galaxy um, redshift bin uh, for the re automatic redshift uncertainties. Uh, one multiplicative shear calibration parameter per source redshift bin uh, to account um, to, to calibrate the sensing measurements. Uh, and a simple power law intrinsic alignment model corresponding to linear alignments um, with a um, power law redshift evolution. Of course, this list is known to be incomplete. Uh, and these are choices of conversations. These are not statements about galaxy bias in the universe that actually goes in step functions by redshift bin. So uh, in order to deal with that, we have to remove contaminated data um, that uh, we know are affected by known but unaccounted for systematics and show that these conversations are flexible enough for our analysis. So uh, let's briefly talk about uh, throwing out data. Um, that's of course something that has to happen in a principled way, where um, our key systematic for galaxy clustering, of course, is nonlinear galaxy bias. So uh, we um, generate input um, theory data vectors, including second order galaxy bias, uh, and then determine scale cuts such uh, that our linear bias model um, is sufficient. And uh, you can see here how our um, simulated constraints shift and eventually get significantly biased if we push down to two small scales. So that's nonlinear bias analyzed with um, linear bias. And of course, that way we throw out a lot of data and you might ask, does it hurt us? And the answer is yes, very much. Don't try this analysis at home. Um, it is uh, quite a coincidence that uh, it looks 
uh, let uh, these different contours look um, line up. But what Anthony Lewis did here was that he reanalyzed the DS data once fixing all the nuisance parameters to their um, best fit values and then also removing the scale cuts. So um, at that point, when you don't throw out data and uh, claim that uh, our model is good enough to push down to these scales, you can see that um, the constraining power um, um, increases enormously, as you expect, because we know there's a lot of modes on small scales. However, we've shown before that we actually need a complicated model. So let's uh, talk about uh, why we um, couldn't push to smaller scales uh, now. So you've seen two slides ago that uh, even us observers uh, have learned how to compute uh, angular statistics, including nonlinear bias. Why do we not use it in the analysis? Uh, and this comes down to the complexity of the resulting parameter spaces. Um, here we try to analyze theory input um, with just linear bias, uh, using analysis code, either using just linear bias or then also second order bias parameters, B2 and um, Tyler quadratic bias. Uh, with different priors. And you can see that um, our marginalized posteriors are significantly biased away, even though, of course, uh, the case with uh, both of these bias, bias parameters equal zero um, will exactly capture output. And uh, these uh, marginalized posteriors get even more biased as we widen the priors. So in this case, uh, if we want to co communicate results um, as 2D posteriors, and not 30 plus dimensional um, um, parameter surfaces, uh, then we have a problem, then uh, our constraining power is not sufficient um, to marginalize over these additional parameters. And um, here's um, some more illustration of how bad this looks uh, using mock input rather than theory input, starting out with uh, the SE1 mocks first analyzed just with linear bias, uh, and then increasing the complexity of our bias model to two and three parameters. And um, again, you can see that uh, using uh, three parameters uh, will um, result uh, in basically two sigma um, projected um, parameter biases, uh, even though the model should be better. So that definitely was not an option straight out of the box. Since then, uh, we've worked um, on how to um, reduce the model complexity, uh, figuring out which parameters are really needed um, at our constraining power and where we can relate uh, galaxy bias to halo bias and co-evolution. So by now we've um, uh, arrived at a two, two, bias parameter, two, two parameter bias model, just using linear uh, and local quadratic bias, um, uh, relating some others to co-evolution values and convince ourselves um, in uh, simulations that uh, this um, minimal bias model is sufficient for the DESC3 analysis. Meaning that uh, we can now in principle use this, um, this more complex model to put, push to smaller scales. And well, here is the blinded preliminary result showing you um, the SE3 um, constraints using linear bias pushing down to the scales where we convince ourselves that linear bias is sufficient for these projected uh, statistics, analyzing the same data vector with um, including nonlinear bias parameters, and then pushing down to um, four megaparsec uh, where we found that for these projected statistics, our nonlinear bias model is just barely good enough. And uh, one of the most important things to see here is that the gain in constraining power pushing down to these scales is really minimal. So um, it is quite a slog through the systematics limited regime. The other part of the data vector that we threw away is the small scale um, Wigensian correlation functions. And there our analysis was limited by um, baryonic effects. Where you can here see a, a nice illustration of um, halo evolution um, from simulations showing you how AGN feedback uh, redistributes metaparticles. And because of this effect, uh, we threw out an enormous amount of the origins and correlation functions. Uh, so here um, are the DESE1 correlation functions and in gray underlaid um, all the parts of the data vector not included in the analysis. You can see that especially for Xi minus, uh, it means that we threw out most of our data. So now 
we push down to small scales by marginalizing over baryonic effects. And for that, uh, Hung Jin built a principal component analysis based on um, hydrodynamic um, meta power spectra uh, from massive black eagle, um, the horizon um, simulation, illustrious um, Bahamas, and the Cosma Alt simulations. So, based um, uh, on these um, power spectra compared to the gravity only one, we built, built a PCA um, for the modification of the um, meta power spectra. Uh, which we then use as a continuous baryon par parameter. And uh, you can see here um, where these different simulations uh, land in our uh, first two principal components. Uh, then using simulated analysis, we show that using just one principal component um, in the modularization is sufficient given the DSE1 constraining power. Uh, and based on these uh, simulations, um, we can also say that uh, we can probably bracket um, this uh, principal component one to range from minus three to 12, which is far, 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 far broader than where any of these simulations fall. And in, for an informative pr um, prior, uh, we choose a range um, that excludes some of the most extreme AGM scenarios. Of course, uh, you should keep in mind that it's not only the prior that matters here, but when you build the PCA, of course, that explicitly depends on what uh, simulations you use. So throughout this, um, um, this um, exercise, we have to assume that the different simulations really bracket the possible range of um, um, feedback physics in the universe, uh, and that we're not just seeing simulator consistency, everybody going after the same model. At that point, of course, our PCA basis wouldn't be useful anymore. Now putting this into the analysis. Um, in orange, we have the baseline analysis. Uh, the green contours with the great constraining power, again, are something that one shouldn't repeat. That is, we push to small scales without marginalizing. Of course, as we expect from Anthony Lewis thought, our results, um, our constraining power improves, uh, and we incur parameter bias. Now marginalizing over the first principal component uh, with our um, non-informative briar, we, um, but including all scales, uh, we removed that bias, but also pretty much lose exactly all the additional constraining power. If we put in um, an informative prior, as I motivated two slides ago, uh, we find that the uh, parameter bias is still under control and we may gain something like 10 to 15% of constraining power um, um, after accounting for baryons. So again, pushing down to small scales and including an enormous amount of initial signal to noise results in a much smaller gain in constraining power. Of course, we can then also turn the analysis around and rather use DES to constrain baryonic physics um, compared to simulations. We can here now see the posterior on that principal component Q1 um, from the DES data uh, and the values for different um, hydro simulations. So um, DES alone um, is um, about two sigma inconsistent with the most extreme Cosmo else AGN scenario, um, which is good because um, that was not uh, really meant to be a realistic scenario in the first place. Combining DES um, plus Planck, in this case, just EE and low E, so that DES and, and Planck are in agreement and we don't have any uh, thing from the possible tension between DES and Planck leaking into our Baryon components plus BEO. Um, uh, we are then uh, getting into a regime where our constraints on baryons get tighter. And um, we see that using future data, maybe eventually, uh, we can learn something about baryons uh, using this approach. One more example of pushing into the systematics limited regime. Uh, now combining um, our standard three by two point analysis with cluster counts. Uh, so here's an analysis led by Chen Hao Tu, combining um, the standard DES 3 by 2 point analysis uh, with um, cluster counts, N, um, and uh, the cluster mass um, observer relation calibrated through large scale two point statistics. That is, we use um, large scale cluster lensing, large scale cluster clustering across different richnesses and the uh, cross correlation between clusters and galaxies all of these on effectively linear bias scales 
so to really uh, constrain the um, mass observation only from um, large scale um, cluster bias, not using um, one halo uh, scales. This allows us to set up a full joint analysis, um, simultaneously constraining the MOR and cosmology, um, and um, allows for um, us to account for selection biases much more easily than when we push to very small scales. Um, in the end, from that, we uh, get um, obtained cosmology constraints that are consistent with other DS probes, but not with the main DSU1 cluster analysis. And in order to validate this analysis um, and deal with systematics, we turn to simulations, where uh, the main um, systematic effect here is um, projection effects and um, orientation biases that affect the um, selection of optically selected clusters. And uh, that then um, also turns into a secondary cluster bias, which affects large scale clustering. Um, and in order to make sure that uh, our systematic realization here uh, is not fi too fine tuned, we uh, created custom uh, simulations, um, or custom mock catalogs on the buzzard simulations that uh, span um, a range broader than we expect these projected effects to be. So the key quantity uh, to keep in mind here is um, the um, extent of a cluster along the line of sight, uh, which um, is a good proxy for projection effects. And that, of course, is also related to um, details of the um, Halo Galaxy Connection uh, model and how exactly um, these cluster galaxies um, are formed. So then uh, we create uh, simulations uh, that uh, span a range much broader than we expect from the data and make sure that our systematic realization recovers the input cosmology um, across all of these um, realizations. With that, then, uh, we um, obtain um, cosmology constraints from uh, just the cluster two-point statistics, um, plus number counts, and galaxy clustering, shown in blue here, which are um, quite consistent with um, other cluster analyses, um, such as weighting the giants, SPT um, 2500, uh, using multi-wave uh, length data, and also a recent reanalysis of the DES number counts uh, using um, the SPT um, MOR or the SPT multi wavelength data for the MOR calibration. And then we can use these different uh, analyses together um, to check what's going on between different analyses. And by comparing uh, one and two here, we can see that uh, it must be uh, an issue with the um, DES low mass clusters. Uh, because the DES plus SPT um, analysis here uses the same sa sample except for low mass clusters. And by comparing our analysis um, with the DES um, year one cluster analysis, um, um, we then see that it must be an issue associated with the small scale lensing. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, I, I just noticed uh, George wanted to ask a question. Is, is, is that still relevant, George, or where I have, have I seen that question a bit late? Uh, well, um, it might be better to, to leave it to the end of the talk. Okay. okay. It's, it's a very general, it's a very general question. All right. Yeah. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> there we go. I'd like to ask it, but at the end. Okay. All right. So we saw... Um, the constraining power that we got here from clusters uh, using a large number of um, cluster two-point statistics plus number counts. So of course the question is where is this information really coming from? And here you can see a comparison of the DES um, three by two-point analysis shown in black and our um, DES three by two-point plus cluster analysis shown in red, as well as uh, this analysis excluding just the number counts. So you can see that most of the gain in constraining power here really is from the number counts not from the initial two-point statistics um, using clusters, basically is a multi-chaser clustering analysis. So that uh, means that, um, yes, there is probably quite some amount of uh, information in the mass uh, function um, going forward if we can accurately calibrate the um, MOR. And the very optimistic um, example for, for LSST is shown here in black, showing you um, how much we might uh, expect to gain um, for um, optically selected clusters, if we can calibrate the MOR with lensing down to regions of 20. That's optimistic, uh, but you can see that uh, there is definitely information um, in the mass function that will be worth capturing in the future. So I will end with a brief uh, outlook. 
after having shown you um, the long slog through the systematics of limited regime to uh, somewhat improve cosmology constraints and what that means for us going forward, optimizing uh, future surveys and thinking about how to squeeze out more, more information from the large scale structure. So in the past, survey optimization may have been very simple. Initially, we could say more galaxies is better. That's of course still true, but it's getting more and more complicated. The next step then is to look at number density and area. Where of course, um, the best of both worlds would be um, large area and high number density. Uh, if you can have only one, and uh, or if you, um, if you have to um, keep money in mind and are interested in um, late time phenomena such as dark energy and standard models and probably uh, improve, um, increasing area over number density uh, will be more advantageous. Of course, this is all still in the statistical era about regime only. Now putting in um, everything that we've discussed before, survey optimization for future surveys really should look like this. Um, considering, of course, number density of galaxies and area as before, but then also directly um, including all the systematics that will have uh, an important um, impact on um, our ability to really constrain parameters. And that becomes a very complicated exercise. Unfortunately, the only easy statement about this optimization space is that basically each of these um, areas of progress is also expensive and takes time but we can pick and choose which of these to optimize. And that's really a lot of the um, uh, effort um, but um, is keeping hundreds of pe people busy working on LST and Euclid um, on the modeling side right now. Just as one example, how much these details matter. Here are um, idealized forecasts for the Roman Space Telescope and Bruin Observatory, um, comparing um, a no systematics case. So even keeping galaxy bias fixed um, to um, fairly optimistic systematic scenarios, marginalized over, over linear galaxy bias, lens and source photo Z's, and minimal shear calibration for tomography bin. And you can see uh, that already including these basic systematics really matters. And uh, then of course, um, scale cuts uh, and everything that I discussed before, variants and such, um, same story applies. You really have to go through the exercise. For, for the Roman Space Telescope, we recently did this. Um, using detailed uh, forecast machinery, starting out from the um, uh, exposure time calculator to uh, get uh, realistic inputs for survey area and depths, folding that in with the um, candle stubby first catalog um, for the redshift distribution of lensing and clustering galaxies and galaxy clusters. And then we combine cosmic shear, galaxy galaxy lensing, um, galaxy clustering in the photometric survey, um, cluster number counts, cluster lensing, galaxy clustering in the spectroscopic survey and supernova 1a, um, including non-Gaussian multigroup covariances for everything except supernova 1a, which you consider as independent. Um, that results in more than 80 systematic parameters, fully sampled in MCMC um, analyses. Um, and with that, eventually, uh, we get to full simulated likelihood analyses that are the first step to really later building an inference code and knowing that we are by proposing analyses and parameter spaces that we can, um, can control. You can look at the paper for the predicted um, constraints for the individual probes. I think that is um, not the main point here, but really that you have to build up um, this technology to figure out what you can realistically sample and, uh, what you, um, and how to combine. And then of course, in the end, um, here's our forecast for um, the total combined um, like energy constraints uh, from the um, uh, Roman Space Telescope. Uh, Euclid and Rubin Observatory um, are going through similar exercises. And uh, when you compare these forecasts, it's really important to read the fine print to see what the systematics and scale cuts are included, as you've hopefully seen in this talk. Of course, having built, um, built all this up, data is different. And um, we might still end up in a situation where we do our first analysis on some data set, analyzing the different probes and get something like this. At that point, uh, we have to ask ourselves, uh, can we claim new physics or are we dealing with unknown systematics? And uh, I'm sure that will keep many of us busy for the years to come. But some initial um, starting points then are to ask, is there scale dependence of the, um, the shift between these contours? 
um, does it get better uh, or worse if we um, select galaxies or clusters differently? Uh, see the cluster example. Then, of course, we can go with the expensive way of calibrating with more accurate measurements, comparing ground based lensing to space based lensing, um, optical um, cluster mass proxies to um, X ray and um, TSC that are more expensive, and a photo to spectroscopic retrofits. Also, we can cross correlate with other surveys, in particular CMB surveys, to compare the predicted cross correlations and constrain uncorrelated systematics. And hopefully, if we've done our homework well, we'll be in a situation where most of our systematic parameters um, have been cast into known unknowns uh, that we mostly know how to deal with, leaving uh, only a few previously unknown unknowns that we'll have to figure out in the mid-2020s. And with that, I'll conclude. Um, as you all know, we're entering the decade of very large um, galaxy surveys um, with um, billions of galaxies coming to our hard drives. And if we want to be really ambitious in these analyses, then most of our cosmological constraints will be systematics limited. As you've seen in my talk, uh, that's often um, a quite laborious process. And we will require accurate systematics prioritizations and priors for all the systematics, for all the probes that we consider. And then hopefully uh, we can use different probes and importantly also different analysis methods uh, to enable accurate cosmology by identifying and understanding systematic effects seeing which of these analyses is affected, um, is um, offset from, from others. Uh, and then eventually, once all that works, we can maximize constraining power uh, by, by um, combining different measurements. Of course, for that, we also really have to set up now to collaborate across surveys and wavelengths uh, and plan for analysis frameworks that make such a combination feasible in the end. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Elizabeth, for your uh, future look at galaxy surveys. And uh, it's very enlightening to learn uh, at all the work that has to be done to mitigate against systematic effects. In fact, I hope the field theorists are very impressed by the fact that uh, you're typically working in 35 dimensions. It sort of puts string theory to shame. And you, you're talking about working at 80, 80 dimensions. Anyway, um, George got in early and, and uh, he, You've got a question, haven't you, George? Uh, yes, yes. Well, I'm sure uh, you know we're going to um, have this panel discussion. So some of these things are going to, no doubt, come up in that panel discussion. Uh, but I do worry about the idea of uh, having, you know, large numbers of of parameters characterizing systematics. You know, and so. Because I think that you know, fundamentally, there are things that can't be dealt with by nuisance parameters. So, if, I mean, to give one example, um, if uh, you have, you know, tails and outliers in photometric redshifts, that's not an easy thing to parameterize. You don't know how you could parameterize something like that, um, and so you can't make a model with a nuisance parameter to characterize that. The sort of things that people have done of of just shifting distributions, maintaining their shapes is very simple minded. And because, you know, you can have tails um, uh, affecting a few percent of your galaxies. And, you know, uh, we're in the regime where that, the, you know, a few percent of uncalibrated erroneous redshifts matters. Um, so there is no alternative, I think, in, you know, with dealing with, with that kind of problem than to actually go out and spectroscopically calibrate your samples. So, you know, you solve the problem by doing a much more expensive observational effort. Um, and, you know, I mean, you know, my, my feeling, you know, for the future when, you know, you're fire hosed with lots of data is that the way to handle it is to throw most of it away. Okay, you, you touched on that right at the end of your talk of um, you, you cut your sample into as many bits as you can and look for consistency between, you know, the different subsamples. And, you know, we, we, we have very good reasons for, for, for arguing that systematics of a particular sort will affect a particular subsample more than another subsample. 
So for example, with photometric redshifts, the blue galaxies are more difficult than the red galaxies and so on. And, and so you can um, you know, cut your, your, your data up and only believe stuff that is consistent across a wide range of subsamples. All right. So but that's the alternative way. Okay. And and you know, I mean, what what I what I um, you know, just to be provocative, um, I think that we should establish a rule in analysis of large scale structure that you are only allowed five nuisance parameters. If you have any more than five nuisance parameters, throw the analysis in the bin. All right. Okay. Um, so anyway, so that's. Uh, I think Elizabeth, yeah, yeah. how do you respond to that? <laughs> so first of all, I absolutely agree that we'll always have to throw out some data. There will always be systematics that we have to give up eventually. But I don't think the story is so easy as saying we are only allowed five parameters. Of course, all I said today um, was meant to look at systematics holistically, not one of them in isolation. And your systematics model will always be only as good as your weakest prioritization. But uh, I don't think we are at a, at a point where we should simply say photo, photo Z's are impossible. Um, I hope Daniel Green will say more about photo Z's and maybe talk through. Um, no, no, I, I, I'm not saying that they're impossible. I, I'm saying that, that, that uh, um, you know, one, one actually needs spectroscopic samples with as close to the selection criteria of your photometric catalogs okay to to calibrate them and if you don't have that that spectroscopic cross check then you can't deal with that systematic with nuisance parameters no matter how clever you are yes and that's what um, all the collaborations are already doing and planning for going forward um, and um, kids and DES are both already um, um, kids has done it in the past DES is currently marginalizing over actual photo Z realizations so accounting for um, variations in the tails. I believe the excellent uh, deep field um, and um, some PZ papers are already on the archive. Uh, maybe Daniel Green can also um, briefly say something about that uh, in the panel this afternoon. Okay, so, very good. All right, yeah, so we will certainly continue this discussion in the panel. Uh, now, I believe Fabian has also got a question, yeah? Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, my first quick question was on Anthony Lewis contours. I um, was a bit surprised that the constraints improved that much by reducing the scale cuts. I mean, did he include the full covariance in this? I believe that's the covariance that we had made public for the DSU one analysis. So that is, um, uh, well, Halo model, um, Tri-spectrum, which uh, is definitely um, simplified, especially for the small scale clustering. Okay. I believe right. uh, in principle, um, the covariance is in there. Uh, my other point was regarding the multiple dimensions in which to optimize. Um, just w trying to simplify this a little bit um, regarding the baryonic effects on matter, wouldn't that automatically put a floor on the, or a ceiling on the number, on the source galaxy density, because it doesn't make sense to measure uh, shear smaller than some scale, because, you know, we cannot control baryonic effects. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But that is not being reached yet by all of these surveys. I am not uh, quite sure. Um, I would, I think I would need to do um, detailed forecasts again for a specific analysis. The main thing I've learned uh, doing more and more of these analyses is that uh, things really don't translate well from one analysis to another. Okay, um, oh, oh, sorry, uh, Oliver had a question. It's kind of running out of time here. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and try to make this quick. This somewhat goes to both Elizabeth and Fabian, I think. There was kind of a strong contrast between the two talks. Uh, um, first, there was Fabian's talk where it sounds like there is a very clear path and a very simple story towards extracting all the information from the large scale structure. Um, and then comes Elizabeth's talk and tells a story of 
um, super complicated data analysis in the end where it's not even clear whether how successful we'll be in five years in, in um, pinning down all these systematics. So I guess, Elizabeth, maybe could you just give a quick statement what you think, what what's missing in Fabian's simple story or how your story would relate to his and then maybe Fabian can respond or something? I don't know. So I think it's very important to start by looking at uh, the fact that these are very different scales. Uh, if we imposed a Fabian's cutoff uh, before calculating correlation functions uh, and uh, restricting ourselves to that regime, I am sure the systematic story would be different. Um, of course, on the other side, there are still some um, observational systematics that will need to be included. Um, and I'm very curious to see how the sampling will go um, uh, once um, all that is um, uh, in Fabian's type of analysis. But I think uh, the, the main uh, issue um, in our um, DS for analysis for right now is that really we are trying to do this at say eight, um, five issue 10 megaparsec scales. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Fabian, did you want the last word or not? Um, just, I mean, I completely agree with Elizabeth. And the other thing was, if you recall the first few slides of my talk, I showed how hard it would be to get cosmology from the galaxy power spectrum alone. And right, this is what we're looking at, one smooth function of scale. Um, that and the projection, I think, are the explanation for the uh, uh, two additional components of the explanation. Okay, well, I think we'd, we'd better wind up there. So thanks 